All right, good evening, everybody. I know it's uh, we're a little light. We still, I see cars coming in the parking lot sideways, but we need to get Brother Eddie started. I'm guessing he's got a little ways to drive once he leaves here tonight. Guess what? We got a little chance of rain this evening. So y'all pray that in here if you can. I told Marty. I walked outside to go to New Boston, and it was 97. I said, well, that's 10 degrees cooler than it was yesterday, so we'll take it. Most of our announcements from this morning are unchanged. Um, Brother Eddie mentioned he looked at our bulletin and saw the number of baptisms that we've had in the last month or so. Pray for these people. Take Keep this, and when you pray daily, you pray for these people. Uh, old Satan's going to jump on them hard. Emma, Halen, Turner, Blake, Lexi, Luke, Tucker, and Jaden. A uh, little bit of a blooper in there, but that's okay. You scratch out Slider and put down Tucker and Jaden, and you'll have that list just right. But be sure and pray for those. Next month, next week's new month which means it will be our fellowship lunch will be next Sunday. Um, just throwing it out there, dark meat fried chicken's always a good idea. Uh, let's see. Our pantry item for the month for the House of Recovery is sweet or dill pickles, but they want them whole. Uh, I don't know. I'm not a citizen of Maud in the city limits. Are we still under a boil notice? We're still under a boil notice, so y'all boil your water before you drink it. Um, Miss Joanne told me, uh, some of you may know, some of you may not, her son Bubba uh, has developed prostate cancer. And he is going in the very near, near future, uh, first week of September actually, to, uh, UT Southwest there in Dallas to get his blood work done and they've got him staying away from everybody where he won't come up with this COVID before they surgery because obviously they'll put it off for a long, long time. So pray for Bubba and Belinda and Miss Joe and the kids and everybody involved in that. Remember Billy's coming home tomorrow. Gary's uh, having heart surgery. Alton was with us this morning. Glad to see that. Dan Fredman having shoulder replacement. Johnny's continuing with his cancer treatment. Miss Milt Marty is waiting on news for her knee replacement. And remember our soon-to-be mamas, Amanda, San, uh, Sarah, and Lauren. September brings a new servants list. Our song leader will be David. Scripture reading will be Connor. On the table will be Tim, Turner, Jason, and Lee. Uh, Sammy and Clay are going to do our table in the evening. Sean and Grant are going to count, and Bernie is going to do our security for the month. Devo's on Wednesday night. David, Dan, David, and Sawyer have those. Birthdays today is Ann Jagger's birthday and Laurel Estes' birthday. Um, day after tomorrow, my baby Aaron and Ray have a birthday. The first, Amanda and Austin have a birthday, and the second, Carol has a birthday. Today is Jason and Jessica's anniversary. Um, Tuesday is uh, Bubba and Belinda and Kent and Amy's. And the second is Tim and Donna. Is there anything that I've missed that we need to announce? I can't hear you. Threesha's aunt. Yeah, that's uh, Ethel Life, if I'm not mistaken. Passed away. That's exactly right. Scotty's going to dismiss us. At the appropriate time, if you're able, at this time, we'd appreciate it if you'd stand, and we'll go to our Father in prayer. Father, we're so very thankful tonight that you've blessed us that we can be here. We're mindful of those that aren't able to be with us. We're mindful of those that are traveling. Uh, Father, we're mindful of the caregivers of our sick. We know how taxing that can be. We're blessed to be here tonight. We're thankful you brought Brother Eddie uh, 
his wife safe to us. We pray that you be with them as they travel home. We pray that you be with him as he speaks to us tonight. We look forward, as always, to hearing what he has to say. Um, Lord, we know that all our blessings come from you, and we're so thankful for it. Uh, our greatest blessing is being disciples of your son, Jesus. It is his name that we offer this prayer. Amen. Giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this and remember it to me. In like manner, also the cup after saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as you drink it and remember it to me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for dying on the cruel cross of Calvary for us, Lord. Lord, we just ask we partake this loaf, Lord. We do it in a manner pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Spirit and by the Lord, and continuation, Lord, we just ask you to bless this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that you shed at Barrel Calvary's cross, that we may have remissions of our sins and join you at your right hand, Lord. We just ask we take it in the manner pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you very much for letting me have the opportunity to come and be with you every once in a while. On this occasion, I would like to spend my time here in the pulpit telling you about the work of Truth of Today World Mission School. Your brethren have been very faithful to help us with that work. I wanted to thank you publicly for the help that you have given to us. I'd like to entitle my presentation, November the 22nd, 2022. It's pretty unusual for somebody to use a date for the title of their presentation, but I've chosen to do that on this occasion because of the significance of this date. This is one of the most important dates in the history of the world. I must confess to you I almost missed it. And had it not been for Susan, my wife, I probably would have missed it. But she told me you had better look at the calendar and think about what you've been talking about because the date is going to get by you. So I did look at the calendar and began to think about it. I serve as one of the elders of the college church in Searcy, Arkansas. We let it slip by us. We didn't even know it had occurred. You may be far ahead of me. It may be you know all about this date. You have prayed over it. You've thought about it. Maybe it's been presented to the congregation and you've thought deeply about it. On this date, November the 22nd, 2022, the population of the earth came to be 8 billion. And as that occurred, the world changed. It's a different world now. It looks the same to us, but 
It's got eight billion living people in it. And we have to raise the question, how can we feed them? Well, the world obviously can provide for those eight billion, but it's gonna depend upon those in power and how they use the abilities of the world. Not only do we raise the question, how shall we feed them, but we also raise the question, how shall we give them pure water to drink? We've got a different world before us. But not only has it changed the world itself, but it has changed the church. Now the church is the same church, you understand. We are a congregation of that congregation that our Lord established on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two. We have the same beliefs. We're committed to following the teachings of the New Testament. But the church of our Lord is under our Savior's global commission. And that global commission has changed. It's not changed in content, but it has changed in coverage. Whenever Jesus gave that global commission, he said, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, King James translation. The King James translation is an interpretation. The Greek word is the word for creation. My New American Standard translation has, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That's probably a better translation, but I appreciate the King James translation of it because it reminds us that Jesus is concerned about everybody. Hebrews 2.9 says that Jesus tasted of death for every man. And our Lord's commission is for his church through the apostles that came to his church. And now we have the challenge to get the gospel out to all the people of the earth. It's a big challenge. You and I are gonna to have to think about it. We have it from pretty good authority that 29% of the people on earth, that's right at three billion, it's not quite three billion, but it's right at three billion, will never hear the name of Jesus during their lifetime. And they will never see a Bible during their lifetime, much less have an opportunity to read it. Almost one third of the eight billion are in that kind of shape. As best I can tell, if you put together all of the things that we're doing, all of the missionaries that we're sending out, all the campaigns that we're having, all the things that we are doing, the churches of Christ, the ones who have received this commission, are reaching out to about 25% of the earth's population. Most of the work that we do is done in English. And remember that around 80% of the people on earth speak other languages than English. We've really got a job on our hands. So as I speak, I want you to think about the eight billion. They're out there and they're real. They have blood in their veins just as you and I do. They have some of the same ambitions, some of the same dreams for their families as we do. I want you to think about them and I want you to listen. Listen as they cry out to us. By their existence, they cry out to us. What are they saying? What are they calling upon us to do? I believe first of all, they are saying, would you pray for us? Would you at least pray for us? About 75% of the population of the world, would you pray for us that we might have indeed the gospel, that we might have our opportunity to come to Christ? When we pray for them, let's pray for them with the heart of Jesus. You remember in Matthew chapter 9, our Lord looked at a pretty large group of people and they were going this way and that. Jesus said they don't have a shepherd and they're living as if they had no shepherd. It's as if they're sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to the apostles, pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. 
that he might send forth the reapers, for the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. I go to a different congregation every Sunday morning. I've done that for about the last 27 years. I'm the most dislocated preacher that there is. And I've heard my brethren pray. I've heard my brethren pray in all the different states and in all of the different congregations. I pray with them. I'm glad to do that. You can tell what a man really believes by listening to him pray and by watching him cry. What do we cry about? We cry about what we really care about. What do we pray about? Usually, we really pray about what's of great interest to us. What did Jesus cry about? What did he pray about? He told these apostles of his, here's what you do. You pray to the Lord of hearts. You pray to God that he will send forth missionaries. In all of my experiences, I've never heard any brother get before the congregation and pray that God would raise up missionaries from our children and from our grandchildren and from our young couples and get them out to these people who are not going to hear unless you and I do something about it. I've never heard us pray for that. Jesus asked us to pray for that. He asked us to pray that God Almighty would raise up from us, from our people, missionaries who will go to those who have never heard. Whenever our Lord was making his way into the city of Jerusalem, he topped the Mount of Olives and stopped there. He would go down the side of the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley, and then he would go up to Jerusalem. So as he stood on the top of the Mount of Olives, he saw Jerusalem spread out before him. And Luke 19.41 says that Jesus cried. It's an unusual Greek word that is used. It is a word that means to cry out loud. You know, like men cry. He did cry at the tomb of Lazarus, but it's a different Greek word that's used. Probably it's referring to tears rolling down his cheeks. You could see that he was deeply moved. You could see him weeping, but you couldn't hear it. But in Luke 19, 41, 51, you can hear it. You could hear him weeping. What is he weeping about? He's weeping about people who are going to reject him. Early on, he had said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that have killed the prophets that have been sent unto you, how often would I have gathered you together underneath my wings as a chicken gathers together her chicks beneath her wings, and you would not. Jesus is moved by the eight million. He wants every one of them to have an opportunity to hear the gospel. And he's asking his church, would you pray? Would you pray to God that he will send forth the missionaries that are needed to reach out to all of these people? I assume that these people also would be crying out for us to plan. Would you plan something for us? You plan for everybody else? You plan for the young people. You plan for the young couples. You plan for the older folks. You plan for everybody else. Would you plan for us? Would you plan so that we might be able to receive the gospel? I was going into one of our elders' meetings not too long ago, and I heard somebody say, what should we do now? I didn't know for sure that the person was speaking to me, but I turned around, and it was Mike justice one of our doctors and he was looking at me right in the face then saying what should we do now I said I'm not sure that I know but I think one thing we could do is to have maybe a class that is a think tank where we bring together some of the brilliant people of the congregation and let them think and dream 
about getting something done for the 75% of the earth who are without the gospel, who are going to die without the gospel. They're going to live their whole lives here and not even hear the name of Jesus. Effort number one. Let us work to help and encourage every national preacher that we can. We have 5,000, we think, full-time preachers here in America. They can help stir up all of the different members of the church throughout America. But let's think about the preachers outside the United States of America. We need every one of them. We need to encourage every one of them. Let's use our time. Let's use our energy. Let's use our resources to encourage them. We need them. We need them out preaching where you and I will not go. You help us every month. Thank you very much. We mail to around 30,000 men. It's the only work like this in our brotherhood. We send them a booklet every month. We didn't even miss during the coronavirus. Doesn't look like much, but it has about 135 normal size pages in it. But we send it in this form because we have to pay the postage by weight. But we mail to 30,000 men trying to encourage them. We send them expository studies. That is, we will take a section of the Bible and exegete it as thoroughly as we can. Sometimes we will call upon others to help us with this. And then after we believe it's properly executed, execute, exegeted, excuse me, we will then uh, translate it. And we translate it into uh, nine different languages and it goes out into 140 nations of the earth. There are 198. We're not in all of those nations. I wish I could tell you that we're in all of those nations, but we're in 140 at least. We're trying to encourage them, trying to help them to have a good understanding of the scriptures where they will be better at preaching the gospel to those that live around them. Effort two, let's work on a plan to cover the earth, maybe with the life of Christ. We went to David Roper when he lived here and we said, David, we want you to take these men to whom we mail through the life of Jesus. We don't want to miss a single thing that he said. We don't want to miss a single thing that he did. Uh, we want you to cover totally Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Put it somewhat in chronological order where we read a little bit better for him. And that's the sound of rain. Let's be grateful. Let's rejoice. Let's listen to the preacher, but let's <laughs> rejoice in the rain. I know I can't compete with that rain that's falling out there, but that shows us that God is good. And because God is good, let's think about the eight million that maybe don't get any rain. Certainly they do not get the rain of the gospel. But David took us through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the best that our brotherhood has done. It's the best work on the life of Jesus that our brotherhood has been able to do. No telling how many have been led to Christ through it. This is the study that he did. Two volumes. And so we decided that let's just divide up the earth into ten parts. And let's take on three-tenths of the earth a year. So that in three and a half years, maybe, we've gone around the earth, not as deeply as we would like to, but at least we've tried to go around the earth, as our Lord has asked. And let's raise up teachers in all these different tents of the earth and turn them loose to take somebody or several people around them through the life of Jesus. Maybe we can at least do that for the eight billion that are out there. So we divided up into 10 parts. 2022, we made it. We covered three-tenths of the earth. And so far as I can tell from the calculation that I have done, we raised up 11,000 teachers scattered out in America, in Latin America, and what we call English three, which would be Australia, the Philippines, England, Scotland, Ireland. We have raised up, we believe, 11,000 teachers 
we sent them a teacher's box. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's not very big. We tried to keep it as small as we could, even though it is a pretty small, it's pretty expensive. But we have in that teacher's box two sets of the life of Jesus, one for the teacher and one for the student that he's going to be teaching. Of course, we believe that he will teach many, not just one. Uh, these uh, two volumes that I have here on the pulpit probably will live for 50 years. Now, they can be burned. And they can be destroyed by water. But if he takes care of them, maybe they will last for 50 years. Then we have two volumes of this book. It's in Spanish, so you might not can read it from where you're seated. But nevertheless, it's on uh, becoming a faithful Christian. It has a New Testament in it. Each of these books have a New Testament in them. They have about 20 lessons on how you become a Christian, how you live as a Christian, how you worship God, how you establish a congregation of the Lord's people, and then a New Testament that they can check and make sure that we've told them the truth. There are seven salvation insights in our judgment. Maybe you'll find more than that, but we've found seven. That is seven times that our Lord told somebody about salvation. And we made a lesson plan for each Salvation Insight, and that's what you see on my left, the bigger type of booklet. And they have that booklet in there. We're trying to stress, now when you come to a Salvation Insight, you make sure they really understand it, because that's when they're going to become Christians. We found that to be true here in America, and certainly that's going to be true overseas. And then there's that little white booklet that just tells them how to be a teacher. That means that we have raised up 11,000 mini, M-I-N-I, missionaries. They can't do everything, but they can at least teach the life of Christ, and that is good. This year, we're working on China, uh, Germany, and uh, Russia and the Ukraine. We're having to wait a little bit on that because of the condition that you know well about and then also uh, those countries that utilize Portuguese. This is really good. Trying to reach out around the whole earth. Number three, I believe that if you listen carefully, you will hear these eight billion say to us, will you prioritize? Will you prioritize what you're doing? Prioritize the way you're spending your money? so that we might get something to teach us the way of salvation. Rain, rain, rain. Just keep right on raining. We'll still listen. Amen. Keep right on raining. I hope we have a soaker. And I hope it rains all during the time I preach. Prioritizing. Do not prioritize your schedule. You may have some things on your schedule you don't need on there. But Schedule your priorities. Find out what you really need to do. Find out where you really need to spend your money. And put that in your schedule. Now, will you cut me a little slack? Did you all hear me over the rain? Would you cut me a little slack? I'm going to do the unthinkable. And I want you to listen to me as you always do with grace. If you had $700,000 to give, let's say somebody gave you $700,000 and they said to you, you give it to charities, how would you spend it? I know a person who did this. She had $700,000 to give. She had to give it. $700,000 to give to charity. And here's how she spent it. $400,000 to a state school. $200,000 to cancer research. $40,000 to the fire department. $30,000 came to us to missional teaching. Not benevolence, but to teaching. Teaching people the way of salvation. And then 
30,000 to an orphan's home. How should she have spent it? Now, I know that I'm out here on a limb right now, and you may choose to cut it off after me, but here's my suggestion. 600,000 to mission teaching. 600,000 to give people the gospel who are never going to get it. All right. 35,000 to our orphan's home. Good. 30,000 to cancer research. Good. 20,000, I guess, is good to the fire department if they need it. 15,000 to a state school. But tell the student that you're sending, I want to be aware of what you're studying. This is prioritizing. If you have money to spend, how about setting aside a quality amount for these people who need you desperately to think of them and help them get the gospel? I believe that in the fourth place that these eight billion are calling for all of us to do something. They are calling for personal participation. You are a Christian, aren't you? You as a Christian are under the Great Commission, are you not? Jesus has said to you, as he said to me, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Has he not said that to you? Are you excluded? Are you involved? If he said it to all of us, then we should all participate. There's something you can do. If you can't do anything, you can at least pray. You need to remember those eight billion our Lord has asked you to. Personal participation. Effort number three. Let's work out a plan to cover the earth with an online school. I would be very <coughs> discouraged if we didn't have internet. If I became aware that we've got now eight billion on earth and we have no way to immediately reach out to all of them, I would be very discouraged. But maybe God chose to give us internet at just this time in history where we can reach out into all the world. We have an online school. You can have it here in Maud if you would like to. That online school, supposedly, if I receive the right kind of information, is in 90% of the land area of the earth. Now anything you put on internet is going to be a 90% of the land area of the earth. Well, this is a school. We've designed the school where they can study the Bible, and if they've got a computer or co some connection with Internet, they should be able to get online and study in this school through the Bible in their own language. We are building it. We haven't finished it, but we've got it about one-third done. We've got uh, 470 courses on this uh, school. A classroom in the cloud. We call it a classroom in the cloud with 1,500 courses in 23 languages. We want to leave this behind. Every generation should leave something behind that's different from the previous generations have left behind. If we have new technology that is available to us, we need to utilize that and we need to leave something behind that the world needs. You and I can do that. We need to think about it. We've been working on a commentary set for some time now. You brethren have been good to help us with it. I thank you for all the help that you've given us. The commentary set literally has been given to Truth For Today. We do not raise any money for it. It's just available for us to use. Uh, we do have the name of Truth For Today on it, but we do not raise any money for it. It is given to Truth For Today to use. We have 53 of those done. We've got another one that's ready to go to the printer. I hope it'll go to the printer this coming week. We can't be sure of that. We've got to get everything done before it goes out. But we've got Proverbs that's about ready to go to the printer. We've got Psalm 119 that's about ready to go to the printer. We'll have 65 whenever we finish. It's the most expensive study of the Bible that our brotherhood has ever done. It's been done by faithful scholars 
among the members of the church. We really think we went about this in the right way. And we're busily engaged in translating all of these commentaries into 22 languages beyond English. We've got some of it done, but we obviously have a lot yet that needs to be done. We want it to be possible for anybody anywhere in the world who has a computer, has an ability to come to internet to be able to study through the Bible in his own language, study through these commentaries in his own language, commentaries written by our brethren who have tried to be faithful in their treatment of the scriptures. Now you can go to your preacher Jay and ask for his evaluation of what we've done. We'd be happy for you to do that. I believe that Jay would give us a good recommendation you could go to Tom, who's here tonight, a person I love dearly. We were in school together back in 1900, skip it. And I believe he would give us a good recommendation. Whether we've done it right or not, it's very important for us to do this and do it right. And it's very important for us to share it with the world. That's our responsibility before God. Number four, let us encourage Christians around the world to set up an in-depth Bible study. Let me encourage you, brethren, here at Malden. Set up a Bible study right here. Set up a little school. I know I'm speaking Jay's language. But try to set up a school where those who can't get free to go to one of our preacher schools or for one of our universities that is teaching the Word, uh, try to have a school here. And take them through the Bible here. And prepare them to be teachers. Prepare them to even be preachers right here in Maud, Texas. It'd take a little work. You need a principal. But the teachers are already here. They're online. And you can get as good a Bible studies as you could get at our preacher schools. Won't be the same. You'll have to bring together the camaraderie and you'll have to provide that. But at least they can get the study of the Bible that they need. And we're urging people all around the world, when you write to somebody, when somebody sends you a letter, say, be sure and have a school there. Here's how you can have a school. And get that started. Get as many people going through the Bible as you can. Number five, let's plan to double, hello, our contributions and use the second half to send becoming a faithful Christian to people throughout the world. We've sent out about two million. And we can tell you that every book that goes out is going to lead somebody to Christ. It's just a matter of getting it out there. During its lifetime, we really believe that it's going to lead somebody to Christ. Has a complete New Testament in it. Has 20 pages on how you become a Christian, how you live the Christian life, how you make unleavened bread how you make grape juice if you don't have grape juice available to you, how you put together a congregation of the Lord's people, how you baptize somebody, it's all in there. Why shouldn't we share that with everybody on earth? Well, do you think we could double our contributions? I know that I'm out on another limb, and you may be ready to cut it off, but would you hear me out on this? Let's do some figuring. Can we do it? Could we double our contribution? Can we double the amount of money that we're spending to get the gospel out to people in other countries? Could we do that? Let me try to figure it with you. I'm going to estimate there are 13,000 churches of Christ. Now, I may be stretching it. If I am, forgive me for that. But let's say there are 13,000 and we estimate those 13,000 churches are averaging at least 1,500 every Sunday morning. Now, some are less than that. Some are far beyond that. But I'm talking about an average. All right, 13,000 times 1,500 each Sunday equals 19,500,000 that we have to spend on what we're doing. But there are 52 weeks in a year, 52 times 
19,500,000 equals 1 million, 14 million that we have to spend on what we're doing as members of the church. Flavo Yakely, who was one of our great scholars on church growth, who died not too long ago, he was a member of the college church in Searcy, Arkansas. He told me several times that he believed as a result of his research that the average member of the church gives only about 4%. Not 10%, but 4%. The average member of the church gives only 4%, he said. That's an estimate, I'm sure. But if we could just raise our contributions up to 8%, across the board, up to 8%, that would give us 1 billion, 14 million, to spend on these eight billion that we haven't had to spend before. And in four years, we would have enough to reach out to every person. Now, we wouldn't have much. We'd just have 51 cents. But maybe we could get them a book or something that would tell them the way of salvation. We can't just let these eight billion come into the world and not even think about them. We can't just let them come into the world and not say anything about them, not plan for them, not try to reach out to them in some way. A few years ago, we had a preacher who traveled around the Brotherhood. His name was Mid McKnight. You've probably heard him. He would say on occasions, we can evangelize this world any time we get ready. I didn't know whether to believe him or not. So I decided to put a pencil to it. And you can receive the benefit of that. You can look at what I came up with. Number six, let's ask our preachers to do more missional preaching. I'm not aiming this at Jay. I think he's one of our leaders in leading others to Christ. But I'm talking about our preachers across the board. I didn't understand how the word missional was being used. And I went to our son. Our son has studied this on a doctoral level. And I said, Steve, tell me, what does the word missional mean? Could you put it in a sentence where I can understand? He said, well, I'll put it in this sentence. The church does not have a mission. But God's mission has a church. And I said, I understand that. God's mission. What's God doing in the world? He's got a mission for this world. He's got a mission that involves all the people that come into this world. God's mission has a church. It has the church of Christ. God, in his infinite wisdom, has said concerning all these people of the earth, I'm going to fulfill my mission, but here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it through the church. I trust them. I believe in them. I believe that they will fulfill my mission. They will fulfill the dream of my heart. Let's preach that. You know who you are? You're the means of God's mission. You're how God's going to get it done in the world. That's who you are. You're special, special in God's sight. You're not here just to build a big house. You're not here to just have a good job and be happy. You're here as a Christian to fulfill God's mission in the world. And that mission is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I believe the only logical way for somebody to say that Jesus may come soon is to him to say it this way. If all these people are going to continue to come into the world who will never even hear the name of Jesus during their lifetime, why would God let a world like that continue to stand? If the church is not going to do it, then why would God let the world stand? Number seven. Let's give Jesus a child's part in our wills. More if you can, but at least a child's part 
And plan it now. Plan it now. Jesus gave you the money to begin with. And this would be your last gift to Jesus before you see him. At least a child's part. This way we can set aside a little more money to use for reaching out to all the people of the earth. Tom will remember this, but when we were students at Harding, we had a mission form. It went around to the different colleges, and finally it came to Harding. We wanted to really have a good mission form, and we selected the theme, Every Heart with Christ is a Missionary, and Every Heart Without Christ is a Mission Field. We contacted the best men we knew, Otis Gatewood, Maurice Hall, and others, to come to our campus and lecture to us during the day and also to preach to us at night. It was quite an occasion. And we came down to the last night. We didn't have an invitation so much. As we had a dynamic sermon, and then they had up at the front of the auditorium flags flags of the nations where the gospel had not gone so far as we knew and as we ended that presentation as we had the lesson come to an end the preacher said now those of you those of you out here who go to one of these nations come down the aisle and stand under the flag Come down the aisle and stand under the flag that you've chosen to take on with your life. I didn't know what was going to happen. We stood to sing. And here came one. Here came one other. Here came somebody else. Young college, young people. I'll go. I'll go to Vietnam as a missionary with Brother Hall. I'll go to some part in Africa. They came. They stood beneath the flag. I'll never forget that. I'll remember that the rest of my life. You know what God is doing, I hope, through this lesson? He's asking you in your heart to come and stand before all the flags. I'll do what I can, Lord. I'll listen to the eight billion that are crying out for my help, and I'll try to do something about it. When we see Jesus, he's probably going to ask us, how are you doing in reaching out to all my people? And may it be that whenever he asks us that question, Lord, we were trying. We heard their cries. We prayed for them. We planned for them. We prioritized for them. And we set aside some of our wills for them. We worked for them. We urged them to have schools in their parts of the earth. And we dreamed about other things that we could do. God bless you. Thank you for the help that you've given to us. Don't ever forget the 8 billion. The world is different now. The church is different now. We've got a bigger challenge than we've ever had before. If you're not a Christian tonight, it would be our pleasure to invite you to become a Christian. We're going to sing a song and as we sing it, we invite you to come to Jesus. Shall we stand and shall we sing? When the trumpet of the Lord